All right, so today we're going to talk about open source software in this video. And I'm also going to talk about a couple things that the textbook says about open source software, which I kind of disagree with. Now, keep in mind, I might be a little bit biased because I am a huge advocate for open source software. I try to use it wherever I can, um, not just because I'm monetarily challenged at times, but also because I really do believe in the open source movement. So I have that bias coming into here. I would claim that the textbook has a bit of a closed source bias in the way that they present certain information on the other hand. So I do believe that you're getting both perspectives by watching my video and also reading the textbook here. Now, when I talk about open source, open source as a whole refers to anything for which the instructions for producing it are openly available. And this could mean a lot of things. There is open source hardware out there where people give you the schematics for actually producing all the circuitry and obtaining the components and stuff like that in order to make that piece of hardware rather than necessarily having to buy it. There are open source let's say 3D printed parts, where if you can find freely available certain parts that you know, you're able to 3D print on your own machine, those parts would be open source and so on and so forth. It's a very general broad term, but it has a lot of uses specifically in software. Now, when I talk about software, it's important for me to define source code. Source code is essentially the code that is used to create a program. When you are actually, when someone is actually writing software, they're doing that by way of writing code. But that code itself isn't meant to be the software. It's text. It's all text that is meant to be somewhat human readable. So when someone writes a whole bunch of complicated code, if they're writing in terms of like letters and stuff like that, if you can actually recognize that there are letters there, then they are writing in code. And that is by itself, not software. Code is just a text file with a funny little extension that shows that it's actually code instead of just normal text. What happens is you then take that code and translate it into machine instructions. You translate it into computer data that your computer is then able to understand and execute. And once it executes those instructions, it's actually running the software. So that process of translation is what transforms a code from human readable text to not very easily human readable machine instructions. And I want to say not easily human readable because there are people out there who can read uh, machine instructions. They can actually look at binary code, ones and zeros, and recognize what's going on, which is frightening. Um, but it's incredibly, it's an incredible skill. But yeah, in the end, um, software is written using code and theoretically I could write code and pass it to someone else and they would be able to translate that code into instructions for their own machine to run and then they would have that piece of software that I created. And that's the idea of open source software, software whose source code is openly available. You're able to give that source code to anyone. Anyone can access that source code and build the program for themselves rather than having to pay someone for that program and never being able to access that source code. What's even better is that if they see something that could be improved in that source code as they're using the software, what they're able to do is, since they have the source code, they're able to tweak it, they're able to make changes, and then push those changes back into the original project. So they're able to improve the project for everyone. Now, uh, 
that is the idea with open source software is that it's open for free. It's offered for free. Anyone is able to collaborate on it to make it better rather than it just being one person or one team of people who are writing that software. Anyone is able to build that program on their own machines and it usually comes with some sort of permissive or copyleft license. Uh, sometimes it even comes with a non-commercial if the author is feeling particularly spiteful. But typically it's a permissive license. You usually see something like the MIT license or the G, the uh, GPL license are two common ones that I've seen. Now this is as opposed to closed source software, which is also known as proprietary software. This is the kind of stuff that say Microsoft is releasing. They're releasing Microsoft Word, Excel, all that kind of stuff, but they don't let you see the source code. Only trusted employees are able to modify that source code. Instead, what they do is they distribute the machine instructions to users in the form of some kind of executable program. On Windows, that's going to be a .exe file or sometimes the MSI or, or something like that. But they're distributing machine instructions that allow the users to run the program, typically with some kind of license that they have to pay for access. But that is closed source software. If you are not able to see how th your program that you're running works, then you're running closed source software. And it can be free. Closed source software often is free. For example, uh, Google Chrome. It's built on what's known as the Chromium project, which is an open source project. But then Google took that open source project, modified it, add their, uh, added their own code into it, and turned it into... Google Chrome and those aspects, those things that they added onto it are proprietary. They are closed source. They make the web browser as a whole closed source. Mozilla Firefox is very similar as well. It is a closed source program to my knowledge. Actually, I want to correct myself really quick. Mozilla Firefox is actually open source. Um, you're able to actually look at the code of Firefox and see how it works, make your own modifications, all that kind of stuff. Another piece of closed source software is Microsoft Windows. You can't actually see how Microsoft Windows works. You can't go in and make modifications willy-nilly. I mean, people have found ways, but they're extremely, extremely hard to do. But you're not intended to be able to make those kinds of modifications to Microsoft Windows. It is closed source. The source code is locked away. However, the uh, a lot of Linuxes are open source. You can actually go into the fundamental pieces of Linux and see how everything works, make your own changes, and actually build it for yourself. And there's actual whole communities of people who are building their operating systems from scratch based off of Linux. So it's really, really neat. Now, back in the day, a lot of code was open source. A lot of programs were open source. Not everything. Um, because computers were so, so, so large and expensive back in the day, uh, operating systems tended to be proprietary. Um, in fact, uh, Linux was built based off of a previous operating system that was attempting to make an open source version of Unix. Unix was closed source. That was one of the big um, operating systems that was used early on in computing. And then uh, Linux traces its lineage from a uh, open source re-implementation of Unix. So that being said, a lot of programs were open source. Um, programmers believed data wasn't physical, so it couldn't really be owned. The idea of selling programs seemed preposterous when you could just kind of copy stuff. Um, that was also the idea that was uh, used with all sorts of electronic files is that you couldn't have 
electronic proprietary files because in the end it all was data and when you're copying data you're not like stealing a device or anything like that but instead you're you're just making a copy and the you know the people who originally had that electronic data they don't know any different because their copy functions exactly the same there's no real difference to copying data and of course that particular subset of the mindset did lead to piracy but the idea was that because data isn't physical you can't really own data you shouldn't be able to own data and this mindset was very prevalent at the very beginning of the internet so as those systems were being developed as the communication protocols that make it possible for computers to communicate across the internet that leads to the fact that you're able to listen to this video off of youtube as all that was being developed a lot of those programmers you know made these protocols made all the programs that they used to communicate open source and the ones that we still use today still are open source we use open source technology in order to do really everything that we can do with our computers just about every aspect of our computers was motivated by some sort of open source program now of course companies began selling licenses for software and this starts out as being really unpopular with a lot of programmers and eventually becomes a accepted practice and more and more and more software starts to become closed source so then we have in 1983 richard matthew salman developing the gnu which is actually that uh that sort of attempt to make an open source version of unix that i was talking about this project is actually the one that uh linux descends from but he also creates the gpl agreement which is a non-permissive agreement that is still used to these days and he's considered the father of the open source movement now i want to specify that he wasn't the first person to really do open source stuff open source was like a huge thing back in the day just because it was seen as normal but this open source movement was more a response of uh, closed source becoming more and more and more popular and wanting to maintain open source freedom. So in this world where software is now being licensed out in order to be used, uh, he creates this GPL agreement, this non-permissive license that really helps open source code kind of continue on in this era. Now you might wonder why programmers would be willing to work for free in order to develop software, even if that software is being used by companies that are making money off of it. Why, why would you want to work for free? Often it's just so much fun. Um, you know, speaking as someone who likes to program, it is a lot of fun. It's a very fun type of problem solving that you don't really get with a lot of other types of work. It can be like a puzzle. And overcoming challenges like that is a very addictive feeling, I would say. You know, they may not mind sharing their work, especially if it's something that really, really helps them with some kind of purpose. A lot of people will want to share that with other people who might benefit from the same thing. Uh, they might want community involvement. That's one of the amazing things about open source is that you can have community collaboration. Multiple people can be working on stuff in order to build a better thing overall. And we as humans love community in general. So it just makes things really nice. Um, they want to make, they want tools they made to help other people because really it's such a good feeling if you can help someone else, right? If you get that feedback that something that you did was so helpful for someone else, it feels really good. And the same thing happens for open source software. 
It also helps them build a portfolio. A lot of software companies will ask if you have any repositories of software that you'd like to share on your application so they can actually look at your code and see if you might be a good fit with their company. So it can be helpful for that as well. That's why a lot of really good pro uh, programming um, classes in school will have you make projects that you can actually keep on your public reposit uh, repository of code so that by the time you graduate with your degree, you'll have this list of things that you can do to say, hey, um, I've coded all of this. You can see exactly how I've coded all the comments that I've made, all that kind of stuff. And if any of you are happening to think about getting into programming, might seem a little bit intimidating given that this is a computer fundamentals class, but I do recommend that you try it out at least. Um, this is something to keep in mind that having a repository like this can be really helpful for jobs. And there's a lot more reasons why a programmer would be happy to work for free on certain projects. Um, if you look at GitHub, you'll be able to see all kinds of projects that people put out there that people have sunk hours and days and weeks and months into in order to make something work. GitHub is full of open source code and it's honestly incredible. So with open source software in particular, collaboration is what makes open source software succeed. If one person is unable to overcome a certain problem, then collaboration can help them overcome that problem because someone else can make a solution and contribute that to the program. Or you can have one person who writes a solution in the first place and then another person who's able to make that solution a lot more efficient. So that kind of collaboration is really helpful and you don't necessarily have that guarantee with closed source software because there's a limit to how many people are working on every single area of a program. So that open collaboration can be extremely helpful for open source software. And it's not that anyone can contribute anything as is. Typically what you have is a person who actually manages the project who can look through all the changes that people are proposing, test out those changes and see if they want to integrate them back into the original project. So it's not complete anarchy uh, and you can prevent people who have bad intentions from doing that kind of thing, but it allows for a lot of possible improvements that you might not get with closed source design practices. And for that reason, it's actually really good for security because you have multiple eyes, many, many eyes on the code who actually can look through everything and see if security wise your program is sound or maybe it's like leaking information or has some kind of vulnerability that might allow like a virus onto someone's computer or something like that. So open source software tends to be really good for security because a lot of security minded people are constantly looking at open source software in order to evaluate whether or not they want to use it on their own computers, whether or not it's safe to use. And you can get that feedback from those security minded people who are happy to give that feedback for free to improve something that they might want to use or that might uh, they might be currently using. And this is opposed to a closed source model where a lot of closed source programs, you know, you have people who are just writing code to meet a deadline. They're writing really, really, really fast and they don't really have time to check everything because the deadline's coming up and they're already cramming to do like 14, 16 hour days or something ridiculous like that. And you see a lot of security holes fly under the radar like that. And because of that, you often get a lot of, uh, security breaches in proprietary software like that, including what's known as a zero day, which is absolutely horrifying. It means you have zero days to patch this because this is already a vulnerability that is that has been released and it is on many, many, many users systems and you have to patch it immediately, get that update out immediately, let people out, know what's going on immediately before something bad happens if it hasn't already. So that's the nice thing about open source is you have all these extra eyes on there that you might not with 
uh, a closed source program. Another benefit is that open source software does not disappear if the original creators quit, which is a huge problem for a closed source. For example, um, Microsoft was supporting Windows XP for a very long time, even after they, re they released Windows Vista and Windows 7 and Windows 8, but eventually they stopped updating it. They stopped giving software updates for it, and they were prompting Windows Vista users to try to upgrade to a new um, system. Now, the problem with that is because they weren't updating, Microsoft wasn't updating Windows XP, uh, they were no longer addressing security vulnerabilities in Windows XP. This was really bad because a lot of computerized things were running Windows XP, such as kiosks for government buildings like the DMV, such as ATMs. All kinds of really important systems were running Windows XP and were suddenly getting, no longer getting security updates, which could be really bad. So there's enough pressure that Microsoft had to agree to give it additional support so people had time to upgrade their systems. But that's the thing is that Microsoft had to be pressured into it. If they had just dipped, then there could have been security vulnerabilities that might have been absolutely disastrous. And that's a problem you see all the time with closed source software is eventually the company will either go out of business or decide they want to focus on other things and they're no longer updating their software. And that can lead to security problems or that can lead to the software no longer become being compatible on modern systems. Uh, Microsoft, again, is really horrible about backwards compatibility because they don't really do a good job maintaining compatibility. So there's a lot of programs that were designed for Windows XP that no longer work well, if at all, on Windows 10 and have to be run inside of virtual machines. Hey, that's another reason why you might want to use a virtual machine, by the way. If you are trying to play a very old game made for Windows XP, or even worse, Windows 2000 or 1998 or something like that, um, you would have to run a virtual machine because Microsoft doesn't support that kind of stuff anymore. And the people who made that game no longer support it either. They're no longer trying to update it. So that's a problem you get with closed source. It doesn't happen with open source because people, if the original creator stops updating something, anybody is able to copy the entire code and create a new version that they can start updating and bringing forward. So that's another benefit of open source there is that you can make projects that are still being used continue well past the time when the original creator no longer wants to work on it. Now, open source software frequently is used in closed source applications. Public domain equivalent or permissive licenses allow for that. And when I was working in software companies, they frequently made use of open source software. And of course, that was a whole thing where we had to check the licenses to make sure there was something like MIT or G GPL or something like that. But we had to check uh, we, we were using open source code in order to build things that were protect, build proprietary software or industry secret type of stuff. I showed this picture at the very beginning of this video, but it's entirely true. All modern di digital infrastructure being held up by one person doing like an open source project that has been thanklessly maintained for decades. This is something we see quite frequently in the digital world. And the nice thing about open source is that if that person has been thanklessly maintaining it since 2003 and then decides that they don't want to maintain it anymore, someone else can take over and continue maintaining it so that all of our digital infrastructure is still possible. It's the equivalent of sticking another block underneath the whole 
pile of blocks next to the project that the person has been maintaining and then allowing that person to take their own block out so that you can you know continue keeping digital infrastructure alive and we actually saw something like this pretty recently where someone was maintaining a programming project that had been used by a lot of other projects non-commercially and commercially uh the and it ended up looking quite a bit like this, where they were maintaining a project that sort of filled this keystone role, just like this tiny little vertical block in this uh, XKCD comic. And then that person got fed up working with it and just completely pulled the whole thing. And everything started to tumble. And with some very quick work, people were able to get another block in there so that all of that infrastructure could be maintained. And that's another benefit of open source because that code was open source. People were able to recreate it and keep everything afloat. That's why open source is so important. So then the question that the textbook proposes is, is open source viable? It depends on what you need it to do. Open source as a whole is extremely viable. It's very necessary. And it's not even that people are necessarily working for free because sometimes people take advantage of services like Patreon in order to have people, you know, help pay them for their work while still being able to offer the product for free. So it's very possible open source will continue. At least unless some company pulls something really weird with it or some government or something like that pulls something really weird with it. But overall, open source should be able to continue. Whether it's viable for every single specific use depends on that particular use. So, for example, you have LibreOffice, which is an open source uh, alternative to things like Microsoft Office and you might be wondering if it's viable to use LibreOffice instead of Microsoft Office. And the question really becomes, what do you need it to do? When you're looking at choosing a software, you need to look at the open source options and the closed source options that are out there. You need to evaluate how well each option works and you need to evaluate if it's just better to create your own rather than using someone else's systems. But really, this is these are questions you should be asking anyway whether there are open source options or not you should be evaluating all possible options and figuring out which one is best for you for your business for the use cases and whether or not it's better to create your own slash hire someone to make your own so asking about this and including open source kind of becomes a little bit um, irrelevant because open source is as good as any other. Maybe there are things like Microsoft Word having more features than LibreOffice Writer, which is the equivalent. That's totally fair. Microsoft Word does have a lot more features, but do you need those features? And if you don't need those features, why not use an open source alternative? And even better, when you have LibreOffice Writer, it has a much better UI because Microsoft's can be kind of confusing. So maybe that is something that is important to you. Maybe that's something you need to think about. Open source as a whole is extremely viable. It's extremely important and it should never be discounted in the way that I see the textbook discounting it. Discounting it like that is, I would say, very dangerous because it could lead to something like the death of open source if enough people start to believe that and, and start to go with closed source. And then with the death of open source comes the death of a lot of really important things that are critical to our technological infrastructure. So as a whole, it is viable for you the question of if it is viable is up to you. It's up to you to research. It is up to you to figure out what you need to figure out every available option, both open and closed source, and to then test them out and decide for yourself.
but I really, really want to stress here that the cost of software is not an indicator of its quality. Microsoft Word isn't necessarily better than LibreOffice Writer just because you have to pay for it. So you have to figure out what works best for you. Well, thank you all for watching. That was my um, that was my argument on why I think the textbook kind of misrepresents open source software. So, you know, I hope it was educational. Being able to hear it from a the perspective of someone who has actually worked with both open source and closed source software from someone who has worked in programming in general. I hope I was able to provide a perspective that the book wasn't really able to in my mind. And again, I want to stress, I don't consider this a replacement for the book. I don't consider my information necessarily better, although I do actually get into history a little bit and that kind of stuff. So I, I, I'm providing things that the textbook doesn't. The textbook might have some things that they provide that I don't necessarily. Again, our perspectives are completely different. Mine is technological. Theirs is business, so I do recommend watching and reading all of that kind of stuff. Make your own decision from what you've heard from me and what you see in the book. Thank you for watching.